Um, first of all, thank you for being here. Uh, we're going to call the meeting to order. We are expecting one more counselor. Uh, Andy Steinberg is here, but on his way. And then we are uh, have two people who are uh, not able to participate, but we are not doing remote participation. In addition to that, however, we are also not taking any votes tonight, today, so we don't need to do roll call votes. Um, are there any announcements at this time? Okay. Um, we basically have two sets of presentations today, and I'm going to call on David Zomack, Assistant Town Manager in Conservation and Development director to introduce the first of the two. Great, good afternoon everyone. Um, happy to be here today to talk about the functional area conservation and development. I'm joined to my right by Stephanie Ciccarello, our sustainability uh, coordinator who will help me with the first part of our presentation. Behind me are Rob Mora, who is our building commissioner and also the assistant director of conservation and development. Chris Brestrup, who is our planning director and Nate Malloy, who is one of our senior planners. So our, our hope today is to take you quickly through a, a very large functional area that does a lot of things within the town and for the town and with residents and businesses. Um, our order today will be conservation first, planning second, and then we'll end with uh, inspection services. We're happy to take any questions along the way, um, or we could pause at the end of each department uh, and take your questions uh, at that point. Why we'll don't we plan to do a pause at the end of each department? Okay. Thank you. That sounds great. Hello, Shalini. So, for the sake of time, I will proceed. Um, I want to call out a few themes that I think you'll hear throughout the day, uh, throughout our, our presentation here from our staff. Um, a couple of the, the themes that I think will resonate will be uh, collaboration, collaboration among departments, uh, with businesses, with the community. Um, community involvement, broad community involvement, that's one of the goals that conservation and development strives for, is to engage our residents, um, school children, college students in the work that we do. Um, support for volunteer committees and boards, you'll hear a lot about that. This functional area supports many of our volunteer committees and boards. And again, I'll let the other department uh, staff talk more about that. Um, we'll talk a little bit about quality of life. We are very focused on the quality of life that we can provide for uh, our residents here, for our families, for visitors. Uh, we take great pride in that. And then good planning. Good planning results in good outcomes. So you'll hear a lot about how we plan together, how we collaborate, how we bring some really smart people together and figure out how to move forward. Um, because not everybody knows what our functional area does, I just wanted to set out very quickly um, kind of some of the broad uh, areas of programs and services. So under this functional area are conservation, planning, zoning, inspection services, historic preservation, and uh, more recently, licensing. So that is a lot under one umbrella. Um, but I think as we go through today's presentation, you'll hear more about some of the, the, uh, the deeper uh, uh, information that we have to provide about various um, uh, things that we do. So overall, we try to help the community make choices. That's one of our major goals. Um, what do we protect? What do we conserve? What, where, and how do, do, we, do we develop our community? What do we want our community to look like now and in the future, in the built environment as well as the natural environment? Those are some of the pretty fundamental questions that we try to help the community answer. You'll hear today about $200 million science centers, planning for village centers, providing permitting for a house or a garage, um, permitting for a wood stove, uh, protecting endangered species, writing grants that benefit conservation areas or recreation areas. All of those things are encompassed in conservation and development. So let's take a look. Um, I'm not going to read our mission statement, but I'll let you just take a quick look at uh, our overall mission statement for the functional area.
And what I want to call out on that mission statement is really three things. Um, the word protect, protect natural resources. Two, to create and implement good planning. Three, to ensure public health and safety. Those three things are really what we're all about on the second floor here in Town Hall. Our goals are to work together to create a community where people want to come to live, work, study, raise a family, and play. We want to have some fun. We want a community where, that is active, that is healthy, that gets outdoors. Sometimes our work is not easy. It's difficult. There are difficult choices to be made. There are difficult conversations to be had. And my staff and I are often in the mix with some of those difficult conversations supporting the boards and committees that we do. People in Amherst and throughout the Commonwealth don't always agree, but the work that we do is critical. We're committed to it. We're professional. And we want to help you and the other boards and committees make decisions that create the community we want to live in. We also enforce regulations, which is not fun, not always fun, but it's very important. We often joke uh, on the second floor that we don't get invited to many parties. <laughs> um, and it's true, because we often have to have difficult conversations with residents, with businesses, with restaurants, with developers about what they can and can't do. We don't set the policy, but we have to enforce what has been set before us and provided for us. So those can often be difficult questions and challenges, but we take them head on and we're professional about it. Again, our goal is to provide support, guidance, and expertise to the boards and committees um, as they grapple with what kind of community we want in the future. Our staff is about 20 odd full and part time staff members in those broad categories, conservation and sustainability, planning and zoning, inspection services, and now licensing. I'm very proud to work with all of these staff folks. They're incredibly committed, um, incredibly dedicated. Um, my job is to oversee the functional area, but also take assignments and support the town manager. So my job takes me somewhat far afield sometimes from this functional area, but uh, overall, um, it has been my pleasure to work with many of the folks who are here now. These departments have not always been together. I think that's really important to understand. We made a conscious decision six or eight years ago to bring these departments together under one umbrella, and that, I think, has shown great dividends. Amherst didn't always have a history of responsive uh, uh, permitting and planning and, and uh, being responsive to residents and businesses uh, and other entities in town. And we made a conscious effort to change that by being more responsive, to being more organized, to being more collaborative, by bringing together conservation, planning, zoning, inspection services. Our health inspectors are now here as well. So Amherst made a conscious decision, and I think, I'm confident that you will hear very positive things about the work on the second floor. So we set out to change that culture, and I think um, we've done that. We're not done yet. We have lots of things to improve, and you'll hear um, more about that in a few minutes. Many, I should add, many small communities, many small cities and towns have also brought together very similar uh, departments. They don't all call them the same thing, but by and large, it's about community development. How do we want our community to evolve and change to serve our residents? Our goals here are efficiency, collaboration, and better service. Service to that resident who needs a wood stove permit or wants to build a house or wants to expand on their existing uh, um, residence or somebody who wants to start a business here or open a restaurant here. Um, all of those things are important to us, whether it's the individual or a larger company or one of our institutional partners like the university or the two colleges. We are always in meetings with them. 
working with them to help them achieve their goals. We've assembled a great team, and I just wanted to touch really quickly on some of the technical expertise within this functional area, and I had to write these down myself. But we've got folks who are experts on wetlands, on building, both residential and commercial. We've got land use experts, planning experts, obviously, energy uh, expertise, electrical, plumbing, and gas inspectors, um, landscape architects. Um, we have forestry. We have a, one, one of our staff members who helps manage our conservation land is a forester. And of course, we have uh, public health experts. All of these people sit within feet of each other, and they all collaborate, and they share information, and they share in that process of bringing projects and initiatives forward through our boards and committees. I've been at various um, uh, events, some of them not, uh, or some of them quite uh, uh, emergencies, if you will, through the years. I've been with our electrical ex inspectors at 3 o'clock in the morning at a school when there was an outage. I've been at fires after first responders get done, and our inspectors are right there waiting to go in uh, to make sure that, that that home or that building is safe for people to move back in. Um, I've been at sewer and water main breaks where we need to make sure that the environment is, is protected after DPW gets done with their work. Um, I've been at Puffer's Pond where we've had 2,000 people unexpectedly come on a May day and we're usually not ready for 2,000 people to be there. And the staff in this functional area have responded incredibly well to all of those circumstances. So very proud to work with them. Uh, I think they serve the community well, and you'll hear more about them in a minute. Um, we're going to move into conservation specifically now, and um, I'll share the mic with Stephanie. So under our broad mission within the conservation department, uh, we take uh, a lot of our lead from the Conservation Commission and the Agricultural Commission. Uh, the the uh, Conservation Commission is the regulatory uh, uh, authority uh, that oversees our wetlands, and Stephanie will talk a little bit more about our wetlands regulations, both at the town level and the state level in a minute. We also manage uh, a tremendous number of um, protected uh, acres of open space. And again, I'll talk more about that in a minute. Um, the staff, you see, uh, uh, certainly a portion of, of Dave Zomek is uh, 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 focused on conservation, and then Stephanie, and then we have a land manager, assistant land manager, and a part-time uh, wetlands administrator and administrative support. So that is what makes up our conservation department. I should say that Amherst has made one of the strongest commitments to conservation, I think, um, and I'm a little proud of this, but certainly going back 50 years, we have been protecting open space, working on water quality, and taking environmental um, planning and environmental regulation very, very seriously. So Amherst is a leader, has been a leader. I hope we are always a leader in environmental and sustainability efforts statewide. So we're going to um, talk a bit about the guiding framework of the department, and there are really um, two dominant um, factors that sort of dictate what we do, and one of them is the, um, the Conservation Commission and their uh, responsibility for enacting the, um, the State Wetlands Protection Act and as well as the town's local bylaw. Um, in 1957, the state enacted the Conservation Commission Act, and that gave communities the option to appoint local members, and they would be responsible for planning for natural resource protection. It gave them the authority to acquire land for conservation of important land and water areas, and also to manage the areas for conservation and passive recreation. Their broad authority actually comes from um, Home Rule under Article 89 and the Public Land Protection, um, Article 97 of the state's constitution. And I'll talk a little bit more about um, the Wetlands Protection Act in a, in a later slide. So as we transition into talking about the town's assets, um, we cannot move forward without talking about the town's open space and recreation plan. Uh, and again, the town has many plans, um, 
you have heard about them. Many of you have been part of creating some of them. And we on the second floor take those plans very seriously and we use them. They're not bookends, they're not uh, collecting dust. So from the master plan, under the master plan is a very, very important document, the town's open space and recreation plan. And this really outlines kind of where we've been, where we are today, and where we'd like to go in terms of conservation, but also in terms of recreational assets. So this document also talks about how departments within the town and within the schools need to collaborate together on recreation. We're not gonna talk a lot about that today, but suffice it to say that my staff and I spend a great deal of time collaborating with DPW, with the folks at LSSE, and with the schools, and I know you'll be hearing more about some of our plans for um, improving some of our recreational assets at Community Field and the high school in the weeks and months ahead. Um, but on the conservation side, this is really what we use to guide our decisions moving forward. Are there, are there parcels of land that we think are critical moving forward that we need to protect? Once we do protect them, how do we manage them? We need to manage them for ecological resources first and foremost, but people also wanna use them. They wanna hike on them, they wanna bike on them, they might wanna horseback ride on them, um, they do yoga, uh, they throw frisbees, they picnic, they swim. Uh, a whole host of activities happen on our conservation land and we need to be aware of those, those activities, encourage the ones that we think are compatible and try to manage those ones that we may not think are compatible with the ecological goals. I won't go into a great deal of detail on this. I encourage you to look at the open space and recreation plan, it is online. This is one of my favorite maps and kind of a, a, a foundation map for us. Um, the town of Amherst up in the north and the south, Hadley over here, Pelham, Leverett, Shutesbury here, and again, I'm not gonna go into great detail, but um, I often talk about puzzles, and this is the great puzzle. This is our, our puzzle of the town of Amherst, and whether you're talking about planning, economic development, um, conservation, the pieces of the puzzle are very meaningful. So in blue, we have state land up on the Mount Holyoke Range. This is the east-west Mount Holyoke Range. And you can see that the state has invested millions of dollars to protect those sensitive uh, resources up in the Mount Holyoke Range. In green are the town conservation areas, con conservation areas that are owned in fee by the town. This tan color is where the town has made a conscious effort to say, where are the best soils in the town of Amherst? And, and those best soils should be protected with those private landowners. So we have what's called APR farms, agricultural preservation restrictions, those farmers, those individuals who have decided to sell their development rights. Uh, we do not take land, we do not force any farmers or, or property owners to move toward conservation. These are all decisions that they've made voluntarily. Other things of, of importance here are to note the land owned by the university, Amherst College, and Hampshire College. So what's left are all those lands in the white. And our hope here and I'm quite confident of this, is that Amherst has made very good decisions to guide growth and development. We, it's something I think we need to do because without it, growth would sprawl throughout the, the landscape. We're fortunate to have quite a bit of water in the town of Amherst, so wetlands and rivers and streams do limit development, but by and large, this puzzle and this map uh, really will guide us for the next 50 years and where we want to develop in our downtown, uh, in places uh, you know, like uh, you know, the Beacon Project up in North Amherst, a logical infill development, um, and in other spots. So our goal now, our land acquisition program was very active during the 70s and 80s, and it's really slowed down considerably. We're very, very targeted in what land we now look at, and we're very deliberate. We're not, uh, we're not trying to work outside of these colored areas. We're trying to connect the dots and fill in those puzzle pieces um, that might make sense. So 
happy to answer more questions about that now and in the future, but please take a look at the open space and recreation plan, and it lays all of this out quite nicely. 80 miles of trails, here are some of the stats that might be of interest to you. 2,000 acres of conservation land, about 50 open field habitats, 80 miles of trails, another roughly 2,000 acres of land protected for farm, farming. Again, private land that is part of our economic uh, and farming agricultural uh, business community. And we manage, my staff working with DPW manages the watershed forests that are in Amherst, Belchertown, uh, Pelham, and Shutesbury. So it's a lot of work. We take it very seriously. Um, you can see around the edges here some of the projects. Um, 20 acres of forested land for conservation, we might not do much management at all on. But when you invite people to come on those 80 miles of trails or to Puffer's Pond or to some other amenity, that's when you need to more actively manage. You need to think about impacts, trash, safety, trails. Uh, those 80 miles of trails have thousands and thousands of linear feet of bog bridging to help many hikers keep their feet dry. In some, in some cases, we are maintaining trails where there have been blowdowns, and we do maintain a lot of habitat for early successional species as well. And as we all know, people really enjoy those fields. They fly kites in them, they walk their dogs in them, and a certain suite of animals and birds really uh, prosper and do very well when they're in those open field habitats. So I'll talk a little bit about the um, wetlands protection work that happens in our department. <clears throat> so in 1972, the Wetlands Protection Act um, was enacted and it gave the Conservation Commission the regulatory responsibility to implement the act and its accompanying regulations. Um, so they basically have the permitting authority um, for the state. And also, they do have a local wetlands bylaw, so they also enforce the town's wetlands protection bylaw as well as its accompanying regulations. Um, what I'd like to point out here, I'll, I guess I'll use this. Um, so whenever we have projects that are within 100 feet of a wetland resource area, the Conservation Commission has jurisdictional jurisdictional authority. So that's the resource area is defined, and then there's a 100-foot buffer zone where the commission has jurisdiction. So anything that happens within that 100 feet needs to get reviewed by the Conservation Commission. In Riverfront, the distance is 200 feet, and the entire 200 feet is a resource area. So all of that means is that if there's any work directly impacting the resource area itself, there needs to be mitigation. So the Conservation Commission has to review how much is being impacted, what the mitigation is going to be, whether it's allowed under the State um, Wetlands Protection Act as well as under the town's bylaw. So um, one of the most important uh, aspects of wetlands protection which you probably see these all over town, and I told Dave I really wanted to point this out because people see this and just think it's that ugly black looking fencing that ends up sticking around town for a while. But this is an incredibly important step in wetlands protection. It's probably the most important step really um, in having it being installed correctly because this is what protects uh, resource areas. And usually it's shored up depending on the project, um, may require more than just the fencing. You may see hay bales and other things. Um, but this is what stops um, material from leaving the site. So when you see this, its important role and function is to protect the resource area by maintaining any of the soil and sediment um, that could potentially run off site during construction of the project until the project is completed and stabilized. So um, know that this ugly fencing serves a wonderful purpose within your community, and you should be thankful when you see erosion control um, installed around town. It's a really, um, it's, a, it's a good thing, and it means that um, the community is doing the right thing and following the, the regulatory framework by protecting the resource areas. Um, so our wetlands administrator works very closely with the Conservation Commission to en ensure that these are installed correctly. Uh, when a project is permitted, that's one of the first steps that has to happen is the, the um, erosion control goes in, the wetlands administrator will go out and inspect the erosion control. 
Um, and then periodically through the construction process, we'll also have to go out and make sure that this erosion control is being maintained. Again, one of the most important um, pieces of wetlands protection. Um, and then there's uh, a, an aspect of um, stormwater management that also falls under this regulatory framework. So stormwater management is also part of um, the Conservation Commission's review. The other thing that the um, department does in terms of wetlands protection is to collaborate with multiple town departments. So especially when there are larger scale projects that are being developed within town that, have, um, that require wetland permitting, the wetland administrator will work with um, the inspections department especially to make sure that they're coordinating efforts, that they're informed about what's happening uh, when and where. Um, also, there's a lot of coordination that happens with state agencies. So in particular, the, um, the Mass Department of Environmental Protection, Mass DEP, uh, which actually administers the federal wetlands protection. Uh, that is something that they coordinate with the, um, the towns and cities and the state uh, agency is the implementing arm for the, for the federal wetlands protection. So there's communication regarding making sure that those um, requirements are being met for applicants. And also uh, the Natural Heritage and Endangered Species Program. So endangered species protection is something that also falls to the Conservation Commission as well. Um, and that review happens uh, and coordination happens with the state agency to make sure that we're protecting our species. I've often said that the Conservation Commission is also the voice for the wildlife in our town. So they have a really um, a broad responsibility for the development that happens within town to protect our natural resources and for the land, but also the, the wildlife especially. So I, I'm not going to get into a whole lot about sustainability, in part because I was recently before you, and you probably heard more from me than you needed to. But, um, but I do want to talk a little bit about some of the things that I didn't really um, mention, sort of o overall what my broad responsibilities are. And that would be um, one is to secure grant funding. So um, with the Green Communities Program, we secured over three quarters of a million dollars uh, in combination with state uh, funding, incentive funding um, for implementing projects. Um, then I'm also uh, involved with um, creating opportunities for the public um, in town through uh, public education and outreach and the annual sustainability festival, which I hope you will attend on April 27th of this year. It's a Saturday from 10 to 4 in the Town Common. Um, it's a really fun event, and it's a wonderful event, but it's an educational event. I, we make it a fair to make it fun, but really at the bottom of the, the bottom line of what that event is, this is an educational opportunity for residents and businesses in town to go somewhere where they can actually get information about um, living more sustainably, working more sustainably, um, maintaining a more sustainable structure. So there's a lot of opportunity there for people to get information. Uh, there's also regional collaboration that happens in town. I did mention Valley Bike Share at the last meeting, so um, uh, we'll um, point out that we have a collaboration right now on investigating community choice energy, which uh, would be an intermunicipal aggregation with the towns of uh, Pel the town of Pelham and the city of Northampton, where we're looking to see the feasibility of whether that's something that's possible, and if so, that would be something that would uh, help us with our greenhouse gas emissions reductions, it would help us with 100% renewable energy, um, it would also help us potentially with more equitable um, uh, energy supply, and so we'd be investigating, we're investigating that, and we'll be talking more about that, and I'm sure um, uh, Councillor Dumont will we'll be talking about this more as time goes on as we get more and more information about the feasibility. Um, and then I wanted to talk about, about, about the solar landfill. If you know the song, um, the children's song, this is the song that never ends. <laughs> it sometimes comes into my head when we talk about the solar landfill. This project really is alive. Um, we have been uh, working with um, uh, Cypress Creek Renewables, and we have um, the uh, power purchase agreement, which has been revised to reflect the new SMART program, but also because we have a new partner, they're looking at the development a little bit differently. So this is, um, this is only a draft, a preliminary draft of what the 
project could potentially um, look like on the landfill, on the north landfill. Um, so we are moving forward with this and hoping to have an executed agreement um, within by the end of the month for sure. Um, and we are uh, finding this project really interesting because for those of you that don't know, um, originally this project was proposed on both the north and the south landfill. So the one with the black lines, which is the potential solar array layout, um, is the north landfill. Thank you, Dave. And the one to the right, which is the south landfill, uh, was also proposed to be developed with solar arrays. However, the grasshopper sparrow, which is an endangered species, is located on both sites. And in communication with the Natural Heritage and Endangered Species Program, the recommendation was that perhaps we investigate the possibility of putting a conservation restriction on the south landfill and protecting that and preserving that as habitat for the grasshopper sparrow. And um, in the, in the trade-off, we could then sort of maximize the development on the north landfill. So that is precisely the procedure and process and steps that we're taking to look to develop the north landfill is by putting a conservation restriction on the south landfill. So some of the things, the community features that will remain on the um, south landfill uh, it would be, first of all, the sledding hill, which a lot of folks um, uh, have utilized over the years, and so that will be preserved. The sledding hill will not go away. Um, we're also looking to put in a perimeter trail all around the entire cap portion of the landfill. Um, and then we're putting in, as well, a dog park, which has um, been moving forward, and so we'll be looking forward to seeing that uh, develop over time as well. So there are community features that will be maintained on this um, on this landfill and it will be preserved for, for wildlife, um, endangered species wildlife habitat. So I'm aware of our time, so I think we need to quickly move forward to get to planning. Um, I think I'll just cut through these slides, but basically uh, they illustrate a number of different uh, projects that we're involved with throughout the community. Um, here are a few more. Again, we're looking forward to working with uh, the new Energy and Climate Resiliency Committee, implementing the Buffers Pond 2020 uh, initiatives um, and enhancing the quality of life. So let me move forward with the uh, planning department and we'll switch up. Thank you. Okay, so hello, I'm Chris Brestrup, Planning Director, and I have with me uh, Nate Malloy, Senior Planner, um, and he's an expert on several things that we do in the Planning Department, including affordable housing and grant funding. Those are the two things that he's really expert at, but he also does a lot of other things. Um, the mission of the Planning Department is to protect and enhance the environment, environmental and economic and social quality of life in the town of Amherst for residents and visitors and to create and implement plans and regulations for preservation of community resources and to promote rational and sustainable development. We have a staff, let's see, where does, where's the button? We have a staff of five people, um, planning director, two senior planners, an associate planner, and an administrative assistant. Um, we also share a permit administrator with the inspection services department and uh, conservation. Um, our governing legislation, let's see if I can do this, yep, okay. We're governed by state laws as well as local laws. So we have um, state laws, Mass General Law, Chapter 40A and Chapter 40B and uh, Chapter 41, and you don't need to know all about those, but if you want to know more about them, you can call me or um, email me or actually email the town manager and he'll... <laughs> ask me to answer you. Um, we're governed by town bylaws and regulations and standards. The town of Amherst has a zoning bylaw and a zoning map. It also has subdivision regulations, which talks about how to divide property and provide access to the property that's divided. And we have additional bylaws um, 
such as, this is an example, we have a local historic district bylaw that governs um, our areas of town that have particularly interesting historic uh, structures. And we also have an, an Amherst Municipal Affordable Housing Trust bylaw, which helps us to um, figure out how to provide more affordable housing in Amherst. We have local guidelines, such as the design review guidelines, streetscape standards, and landscape standards. Um, a lot of what we do in the planning department is supporting boards and committees that are involved in permitting. So the planning board and the zoning board of appeals are the primary permitting bodies in Amherst for land use permitting. When someone wants to develop a property or change a piece of property or a building in town, they usually have to go to either the zoning board of appeals or the planning board for a permit. These permits can take the form of approving the subdivision of land. Um, they can be site plan reviews of new buildings and activities on properties, um, granting special permits for things that are not ordinarily allowed but may be allowed in special circumstances. And other boards and committees are involved in the permitting process, such as the Historical Commission, the Local Historic District Commission, and the Design Review Board. Some of the recent projects that have gone through our uh, department and the Planning Board and the Zoning Board of Appeals are the North Square Project at the Mill District. You may have found, uh, heard about this one. Let's see if I can make this work. There, that one, yeah. So that has 130 uh, apartments, um, 26 of which are affordable or will be affordable at a level of 50% or less of area median income. So we're very proud of this project and we think it's gonna be a real asset to North Amherst. It also has 22,000 square feet of commercial and retail space. Um, there's a mixed use project currently going up on University Drive um, and it will have 36 apartments and four affordable units. Uh, here's a project that's already been completed um, it's on North Prospect Street, and it was the reuse of uh, the old Hastings family property, which has a beautiful historic building on the uh, frontage, and then uh, four townhouses were built behind. Um, and then we have a new building that's being proposed on Spring Street, and this has been approved by the planning board. It's gonna have 58 units of um, market rate housing. Sure. Hi, I'm Nate again, and I'll speak to the next few slides. Uh, for affordable housing, the town's been a leader uh, for affordable housing for a number of years. So, you know, our work's just carrying over what, you know, the town has done for decades. Um, just a brief summary of the housing in town. So when UMass expanded in the 60s and 70s, there were a lot of multifamily developments around town. Uh, and then subsequent years, the regulations changed and those types of developments weren't allowed. And so you know, in the 80s, 90s, and early 2000s, the most of housing growth was single family homes and small developments. And that has led to a lot of pressure on different types of housing for different populations. Um, you know, I think the town's seen that, so we've always been trying to, um, you know, preserve and, and create affordable housing. So the state has a, you know, if 10% of your housing stock is affordable, you're kind of okay. And Amherst has been above that threshold since the mid 80s. I think the town's recognized that that's not a housing goal, it's just a number, so we're trying to create housing for different populations. Uh, the town really isn't a developer of housing. The town facilitates projects, so in the planning department, um, we'll work with consultants or we'll work with the developers to develop property. Um, when Rolling Green was set to expire a few years ago, 42 units could have been um, you know, washed away from being affordable, and so the town working with Mass Housing Partnership as a strategic consultant, looked at who would be willing to buy this property or preserve those 42 units. And that was successfully done when Beacon Community stepped forward. But the town's role there was to facilitate it and to research it. So we knew a few years ahead of time, and we used different funding to hire lawyers um, and consultants to determine what can we do to preserve those 42 units. And so that was something that the town can do. Um, What's really important to affordable housing is uh, state and local grants. The Community Preservation Act funding, CPA funding, is really important. And so that's local funds that the town can spend on um, anywhere from feasibility studies to construction. And a lot of times those monies are spent on costs that grants won't refund. So it's feasibility studies, it's engineering studies, it's upfront work to make projects happen. And so I think CPA funds are very instrumental in affordable housing as well as open space. So those funds can be used by the town to really help preserve and create affordable housing. 
Uh, recently, there's the Housing Trust, and so that was adopted by a town meeting. There's a bylaw in the general bylaws, and the trust is actively trying to create and preserve affordable housing. It's a volunteer committee. It's a town board. Uh, they have a lot of powers prescribed by Mass General Law, and right now they're trying to do outreach. Uh, they're trying to engage the community on how to, um, there's a consultant that's reaching out to people to determine where to build housing, and they're looking at the East Street School property for affordable housing. And so they're you know, looking at what other properties in town could be made for affordable housing. Uh, community plans, I think people say Amherst like to plan. Uh, I think the plans are important. So the plans touch on different aspects of community life. There's the transportation plan, the open space and rec plan, there's a housing plan, and all these plans are incorporated into the master plan. And the master plan was adopted in 2010. It was the first time the town really adopted a plan in about 40 years. And it kind of set the guiding framework for how Amherst wanted to um, develop and grow over the next you know, so many years. Um, you know, the plan respected the history of the town and it also provided recommendations and strategies to move forward. And it's about 10 years old and so it's time that it could be updated. Um, a really important piece of these plans is that it involves usually um, a robust public process, and so the plan starts with an idea, and then the planning department can um, facilitate consultants, so oftentimes you work with outside parties to help produce a plan, and so there's a whole public process to get a plan um, implemented, and it can take you know a few months or it could take a few years, and so with the master plan, it took two years um, to get that plan ready and consolidated. Um, and I think the work of outside consultants is very important. They can lend expertise and knowledge. So we recently worked with Weston and Sampson at Community Field and their engineers and landscape architects to, who really looked at what can be done to um, improve field conditions and also what different types of concept plans can be developed on the high school, middle school, and those fields that meet different community needs. And so we relied on their expertise to develop concept plans, hold public meetings, and then synthesize everything into a report that will be due out soon. And so, you know, working with consultants is something that the planning department does, and we use them, you know, pretty strategically when we need to. Uh, board and committee support. There's over 15 boards and committees that the planning department supports. There are the regulatory boards, the planning board, and ZBA that Chris mentioned. And it's really important that we have staff to help guide those boards. They're volunteer citizens who are implementing you know, complex state laws and regulations, and so planning staff helps guide that, those boards and committees. And then there's a number of local boards, and they can be advisory, they could be term limited, so maybe it's a task force that meets for a year on a specific topic, like the dog park or downtown parking. Um, you know, the boards, I also like to think of them as little worker bees, in that they are, you know, members of the community, they come back to town hall, and they help provide a pulse on the community. And so, you know, with uh, 15 boards, that could be, you know, 100 different people that have different ideas and perspectives that come and bring those ideas to each board and committee. And so I think it's a really important way to get community feedback during different processes. So the value of boards and committees, um, you know, sometimes can't be understated because they really provide, you know, that pulse on the community. And just a little snippet, um, in FY18, there was over 200 meetings that staff attended, and many of those are at night, and there were 120 applications reviewed by these boards and committees. And so, you know, it's at least once a week um, maybe twice a week. Town projects. The planning department is involved in a number of projects, often in collaboration with public works or leisure services or uh, conservation. And so the projects can be small. They can be something like using CPA funds to restore the Dickinson family plot in West Cemetery, or they can be a larger project like the North Common. Um, they also take a lot of time. So the lower image in the left is Groff Park, and that's something the planning department has been involved with for over two years. So the planning department helped um, work with consultants to have uh, concept ideas and go through a public input process. We're working with consultants now to finalize designs and then bid it, and then we'll be working with the, um, the contractor to construct it, so, and to apply for grants. And so, you know, when this, when Groff Park is done, it'll be a three or four year project. And so it's something that the planning department sticks with, you know, from the beginning to the end. And uh, grants, the, um, in the last few years, the town's been awarded over six million in grants. I will say grants are becoming more competitive. You know, 10 years ago when I'd go to a workshop, there might be like five or six people in the room. Now there's about 40 or 50. Uh, most grant applications require a local match, a cash match, and a public input process to apply for a grant. So that means it 
can take two to four months to get a grant application ready. And that local cash match is really important. And so CPA funds, as I mentioned before, are really instrumental in, in applying for grants. Uh, the Community Development Block Grant, CDBG, is the most complex grant we apply for. Uh, the town's a mini entitlement community, which means we get federal funds administered by the state. We get up to 825,000 a year. It takes about seven or eight months to apply for this grant. We have a standing block grant committee. We go through a public input process. We have requests for proposals. And then we have uh, 12 to 18 months to execute the grant and implement the projects. And so, um, you know, that rolls over. So every year we may have two or three grants going on at the same time that have various projects. Um, the other grants listed here can be used for um, open space, for recreation. Uh, there's an infrastructure grant we apply for. And so typically in a year we may apply for 10 or 12 grants. Um, we may, you know, we get awarded all of those, we'll be really busy. Um, but you know, we, we try, you know, I like to think we try to apply for one a month and, um, you know, and that takes, you know, months of planning ahead. So we, you know, we keep rolling the calendar and, and move that along. So um, the planning department is very committed to reaching out to the community to educate the community members about what we do and to explain zoning bylaws and other regulations to people who are interested, to inform people about town projects and to provide in information about private projects that are going through the permitting process. We welcome community members to call us or come and meet with us to find out about projects, to ask questions and to uh, give us information that they might have. Um, we try to put information online about most of the major projects that we're working on. We hold uh, frequent community forums to talk about projects that are of interest to the public, um, such as Groff Park. There were community forums held about Groff Park while we were developing the design for that. And we've also held uh, recent forums on the North Common and Main Street parking lot project. Um, in addition, we have a wealth of information online. You probably have become familiar with it uh, as a result of becoming counselors. Um, but there's a terrific GIS, um, geographic information systems program that we have that tells us information about all of the properties in town, just about anything that you might want to know. Um, and we use it to help ourselves as well as the public to understand issues related to land use. Um, we also seek public input. In addition to um, having uh, public forums, we put information online and seek public input that way. So one of the projects that's recently been put online is the um, Bicycle and Pedestrian Network Plan. We've been working on that with the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission, uh, our planning department, and the Transportation Advisory Committee. Um, and that plan is almost finished, and the TAC, the Transportation Advisory Committee webpage, uh, contains the plan if you choose to look at it, and you would be welcome to um, uh, submit comments uh, to um, to the TAC on that project. Um, I think that uh, comments are due maybe February 1st, something like that. But anyway, take a look at that. Um, and uh, some of the steps that we're uh, taking in the near future, um, we know you're all interested in zoning and planning and all of that. So um, we're planning to work with the planning board and the town council to review the master plan and possibly update the master plan if we determine that it needs to be updated. Um, there are many sections of the zoning bylaw that we feel need attention, um, so we would either like to uh, address those individually or perhaps address the zoning bylaw as a whole at some point with your assistance. Um, and we would like to engage the community in ongoing projects, such as the work on community field that Dave and uh, Nate talked about, our planning for village centers, including the downtown, uh, building the projects that we have planned, such as Groff Park and the North Common, applying for grants and funding to support future projects, and collaborating with other town departments to make project review and implementation run smoothly and be complete. That's a really important part of what we do. So we look forward to working with you uh, to plan for the future of Amherst. And now, I'd like to introduce Rob Mara, Building Commissioner. Thank, Thank you. you. Hi, Rob Mora. Um, going to move really fast. Uh, so, um, inspection services, uh, in, in addition to our core services, building, uh, zoning, uh, 
plumbing, gas, and electrical. We also have health inspection, all the environmental health inspection and permitting programs, uh, land use uh, permit coordination, electrical uh, code enforcement, and uh, licensing is highlighted there because it's coming soon once the uh, Board of License Commissioners is established. Uh, we have a couple of building inspectors, a uh, code enforcement officer, uh, we share the permit administrator that you heard about, and electrical inspector, and a couple part-time uh, inspectors for gas and plumbing, two health inspectors, and some administrative staff uh, to work on our programs. Uh, the, the permit administrator role is a very key position uh, in our department. Uh, that was established about five years ago uh, with the idea of being the person that will coordinate for the applicant the permitting path through the various boards, committees, uh, town officials, departments, and bring those, those people together to make sure there's an efficient uh, process laid out for that applicant. Uh, that has been a very well-received uh, uh, position uh, in, in the community, and we, we hear positive feedback regularly about that. Um, permitting, uh, this slide just illustrates uh, the breakup of our core services, electrical, building, plumbing, and gas. Uh, we do all of our own uh, plan review, permitting, inspection uh, by our own staff. We do not hire any outside services. Uh, we have a very quick, efficient turnaround for permitting, uh, reliable and predictable service to uh, the contractors, the homeowners who are coming in, trying to get their project going. The developers uh, know when we are available for their inspections to keep their projects moving. Uh, we also established years ago a joint inspection team. Uh, this is where uh, representatives from each of the departments will get together regularly to talk about what's going on, how to address certain uh, projects or issues, and, and make each other aware of what's going on. And it's an opportunity for one inspector to learn about something uh, that's going on they, that they might not have otherwise known about it, uh, especially with uh, the departments uh, that are not within our office here in conservation and development. Uh, here's, a, here's a few recent projects. Um, I'll just talk a little bit about the Hitchcock Center and Kern Center because I think um, we feel like we were very fortunate to work in Amherst uh, during these projects. Uh, those are living building challenge projects, uh, something that is very unique and, and uh, we felt fortunate to be a part of that and learn as the designers and the contractors did through the construction of those buildings. Uh, we recently worked uh, to have the Science Center uh, open on time, uh, and there's a couple of projects, a uh, couple of photos there. I wanted to just highlight electrical a little bit because it's unique to our department because it's the only service that we uh, provide to UMass. Uh, the state does have uh, plumbing inspectors and building inspectors, but they do not have electrical inspectors. Uh, so we are working uh, at UMass uh, weekly uh, for electrical services. And down at the bottom of that uh, bullet list there, uh, I just wanted to mention that our electrical inspector is one of the inspectors that is uh, regularly called for emergencies, whether it be a fire or a broken water pipe, uh, they're available. Our electrical inspector is here, Tina Shen, out in the back there. Um, Large-scale solar, uh, this is uh, images of some of the recent projects and Pulpit Hill Solar, which is under construction right now, right in the middle. Um, <clears throat> rental registration, this uh, is our, our permitting program for residential rental properties. Uh, came into effect in 2014. Uh, it's been a very successful program. I think it's accomplished everything we hoped it would uh, with identifying the properties and um, co creating contacts and communication between the landlords uh, and property owners. Uh, code enforcement is a uh, big piece of the work that we, we do here in inspection services. This, this illustration here, um, the numbers aren't so important, um, but it, what it, what it, what's important here is that we now have several years of data that we never had before because this was a new, uh, new effort on our part. Uh, what you'll see in the blue represents the uh, building or the code complaints. The uh, purple color would be zoning, more uh, related to cars parking on the lawns. Uh, and the green at the top just represents the small number of, of situations that result in some sort of a, a citation or a fine being issued. Uh, what's interesting here is that the blue area has grown in the recent years, and I think that's another uh, indication of the success of the program. 
because we are now hearing from people that we normally we didn't hear from before. So we we have this presence, we have this online um, uh, access to us and information, and we we now get calls or complaints or notifications from residents, tenants, parents of tenants, and and just a variety of people that we didn't before uh, this program started. So it's it's really been a great effort. Uh, here's some images of a few violations that we typically see. You've got the trash, the cars on the lawn, smoke detectors being removed. Uh, the bottom left, the, the, so the, the chair there on the top of the car, I like to keep that one in there because that's a situation where we asked for the, the, the chair to be removed from the property and that's where it ended up. <laughs> Uh, our COI, this is our Certificate of Inspection program. This is a program that I'm very proud of. Um, a lot of communities are unable to complete this. This is a building code mandate that we perform a periodic inspection of certain buildings. Uh, I'm proud to say that all the buildings that we are able to identify through our assessing records, through our rental permitting program have been inspected. Uh, this is uh, looking for just the basic uh, systems working in the buildings, the, the, the fire alarms, the exit signs, the stairways being safe. Uh, so we're, we're working really hard on that. Multifamily is uh, one of the pieces of that certificate of inspection program that we added a couple of years ago. Uh, because we now had all this information from the rental permitting program to know where these properties are and how many units were in these, pr these properties. Uh, so we were able to conduct inspections. This is not inspections of the individual dwelling units. This is just the common areas. Make sure the stairways and the doorways and the major systems in the building, if they have fire or sprinkler systems, are uh, tested and functioning properly. One piece of that down at the bottom, the last bullet, are fire escapes. That's uh, something that we take very seriously. Uh, we are required to look at fire escapes every five years by the building code. Uh, 67 of them so far have been looked at, many of them replaced, many of them repaired, and many of them just certified as being in good condition. Here's a couple of examples of fire escapes that were very poor condition uh, that we came across. Uh, here's uh, the after up top of a safe, uh, sound fire escape. Uh, our online uh, uh, presence is uh, very, um, you know, very much there for our rental permitting and our complaint uh, program. Uh, complaints can be filed online, photos can be attached. It goes directly to a code enforcement officer and uh, worked on immediately. The results can be followed online and uh, that way they can, people can follow up and see where, uh, where the case is at any time. Here's a map that was created years ago just to show where our activity is. Um, the, the different colors represents the type of, uh, whether it's an open or a closed uh, case, but then we recently, or in the last couple of years, added the blue dots, which show the fire, the, the police department's response for certain noise violations. Uh, health licensing and permitting was moved into inspection services a couple of years ago. That has proven to be a very uh, good uh, change. Uh, we are able to work very closely, building inspectors and health inspectors. Uh, on, on the various projects or um, renewals of licenses. Uh, online permitting, um, you're able to file your rental permit online currently. That's the only online permitting that we, are, we have available. Uh, we do have a, a kiosk at the uh, outside of the office where we can help uh, applicants work through their online uh, renewal if necessary. Uh, Another nice feature of the mapping system uh, in the uh, tabs to the right, the permitting uh, tabs will show all the uh, building permits, recent and uh, uh, archived uh, zoning and other permits. It will also show complaints and violations and the status and uh, any of the documents that might be attached to go along with those, uh, those cases. Uh, we put a significant amount of time into our out outreach and education. Uh, neighborhood, neighborhood resource uh, fairs uh, is something more recent. It's a uh, combination of our code enforcement officer, APD, and UMass to uh, go out into neighborhoods, uh, talk to tenants, invite uh, landlords and residents, and bring everybody together to talk uh, at certain times of the year. Um, looking ahead, what we're really uh, focused on this year is expanding our online permitting. 
it's uh, something that is uh, underway with the IT department, and we're hoping to uh, use technology uh, more in the future. Thank you. That was about as fast as you could go. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, given the time, we're not going to. Um, it's really up to the council. Um, I know there must be tons of questions. Um, would you like to have a few questions at this point? Uh, I just want to point out that we do have the fire and police department uh, ready to make their presentation as well. Pat. I feel like I can hold my questions and contact people with that. Through the town manager, please. Or contact the town manager. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Any other? Okay. Then we're going to move on to the public safety side of town. And we have both the police and the fire department. And I guess we're going to start with... I'm sorry. Three minute break. Is there a um, three minutes. That's it. <laughs> a three minute break. So yeah, if we, if we want to get out of here quickly, the best I, advice I can give you, if you want an overall workings of how police agencies work, just watch that 80s segment of Barney Miller, and I can leave right now. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's. That was the best show going as far as what goes on in police agencies. But um, no, I will try and be brief. Uh, again, uh, I've been the police chief here for just over nine and a half years. I've been employed in the town for 42 years. Um, I came here right out of high school and I've been here ever since. So um, continuing on, Ron, our mission statement was designed by um, members of the community and our police department uh, patrol staff back in the uh, year 2015, it was updated, and it really represents kind of what our agency is all about. We're very, very proud of that mission statement. Um, continuing on, we are a Massachusetts police accredited uh, agency. Um, what that means is that we are held to the highest standards of professionalism, both with policies, procedures, um, equipment, training, uh, pretty much everything that encompasses a police department. Uh, this is a mass, uh, this is a state agency that oversees police departments to make sure that they are practicing best practices and, and doing everything in a professional manner. We were the second um, police department that was accredited in the, in the entire state back in 2001. Additionally, I think you'll be receiving uh, an email from me if you haven't already. We are going for reaccreditation in February of this year, so. There will be a lot of press releases coming out about that, so look, look forward to that. Uh, just our organizational chart where we stand, um, uh, part of my responsibilities in addition to the police department is I oversee the communication center with uh, Chief Nelson um, and the animal welfare office uh, as well with Carol Hepburn. Where we are as an agency breakdown, um, we, have, we are budgeted for 48 officers. Um, 13 of those being staff, 25 uh, patrol officers that makes up the brunt of the, the, all the work uh, in the agency, including two canine officers. Uh, eight officers are dedicated to the detective bureau. I'll go through that in a little bit more detail. And we have two full-time officers whose really their, their entire work encompasses community outreach. And I'll touch on that as well. Um, so staffing budget, uh, we are, I think, still the largest portion of the public's uh, sec uh, part of the public um, budgeting process, us, the fire and EMS, probably second only to the school department budget, so um, the largest portion of the public sector budget. So the patrol division, yes, um, so they uh, handle the brunt of all the calls that come into the, the agency. You know, pretty much everything starts with the, the patrol officers themselves. Um, you know, from initially responding to calls, do, doing proactive patrolling, traffic enforcement when they can. Um, we don't have a specific dedication to, for traffic enforcement, although that's something that we would like to add on. Uh, we get a lot of requests for traffic enforcement in neighborhoods. Um, officers are also responsible for doing all follow-up, 
So if they respond to calls that initiate uh, something uh, as basic as maybe a car break-in, they are responsible for not only completing those reports, but then doing additional follow-up in regards to that investigation as well. We do a lot of community policing initiatives that the patrol officers are responsible for in each of their assigned sectors. We went to sector-based policing uh, back when I became chief in 2009, and really what that means is that each officer uh, on a yearly basis is assigned to a very, very specific geographical area in town. And they are responsible for not only answering calls in those sectors, but recognizing problems and issues that might be very, very unique to those neighborhoods, and then finding, response, finding answers and, and you know, doing uh, problem solving for those specific neighborhoods. So in a very condensed word, it's, you know, it's their responsibility to do what's right for that, for that sector and figuring out what that specific neighborhood needs for policing. Uh, that's just a breakdown of our service calls. I can tell you, you know, the calls for service has gone up in, in uh, some areas, but overall when it comes to crime and crime prevention, extremely safe town. Uh, a lot of the areas that we've really been concentrating our efforts on the um, arrest numbers are way down and the call volumes are way down, specifically areas of uh, quality of life issues, whether it's noise disturbances, disturbances in general, fights, um, you know, things associated with alcohol and young people are just way, way down. And, you know, that's really um, kudos to our officers for their community outreach. So if you check your budgeting books and compare with years in past, you'll see reductions in really, really important areas of crime prevention. Our Detective Bureau and Administration, like I said, eight officers are assigned as detectives, uh, one being a lieutenant, one a sergeant, and then the, the rest of them are the worker bees. Um, they are responsible for all investigations with the agency, all the court functions, uh, scheduling of hearings, uh, everything of that nature, background checks, and they process and collect all of the evidence. Um, you know, depending on, you know, what they're investigating, uh, I'll give you two examples. We had uh, most recently, and um, the Detective Bureau was responsible for an investigation that took over three years. It was about house breaks, and it started in the town of Amherst, ended up uh, being involving agencies in Franklin and, and the Berkshire County. We solved the case. Um, Tina Knightley was the detective responsible for that well over 600 hours of investigation, like I said, three years, um, charging three individuals, over 400 house breaks involved. Um, another example, I think most people are um, familiar with the home invasion we had on Southeast Street a couple of years back. That was another investigation that really took the entire Detective Bureau to solve, but again, uh, 300 plus hours of investigation went into that case. So depending on the uh, investigation, it can involve all the officers involved in the Detective Bureau or just one or two, but uh, they do an outstanding job and really, really proud of the work that they do. Again, community outreach is a huge part of what we do as an agency. Um, you know, when I took over as chief um, nine years or so ago, I was really kind of frustrated with the fact that we were just responding to the same calls over and over and over again and we didn't really see any end in sight. So that was one of the reasons that we changed kind of how we operated as an agency, wanted us to be more proactive um, and, and, you know, have the officers involved and participate in, in problem solving. And so that, um, that's a, another part, the community outreach with our neighborhood liaison officer. Um, I'm sure you've read his name, Bill Laramie, who's a um, specially trained officer who deals with crime prevention through environmental design. And what that really means is he'll look at a specific problem with the sector-based officers and they'll come up with solutions. And the um, biggest example of that is probably the townhouse um, condominium, condominium complex on Meadow Street and what they've done there and also what they've done on Hobart Lane and the Phillips Street and Farring Street areas. So really a lot of success stories there and they are branching out into other parts of the town. So. You know, our um, downtown community outreach officer, Officer Casey Nagel currently works closely with the business improvement district people and the uh, chamber stakeholders there with the business people. He works very, very closely with uh, the individuals who are homeless or at the shelter. He knows them all personally and, and they have a really good relationship. So really, really uh, um, 
excited with the work that he's doing. Our Adventure Academy summer camp is something we've been doing for since, you know, for 15 or 16 years now. It's a free camp that we offer to residents of the town of Amherst and, and students, an opportunity for the officers to kind of take a break and relax and, um, you know, kind of hang out with students. And uh, we do that with the University of Mass Police Department. Very successful program. We're actually thinking about adding weeks onto that because we usually have to turn people away from that. Uh, Ronnie, you can continue on. <clears throat> about four years ago, we we initiated a crisis intervention team, yep. um, which is a specially trained team uh, that incorporates about 25 or 30 percent of the patrol force. And the concept behind that is, is that we we respond not only when people are in crisis, but also for aftercare purposes. And the, the idea behind that is to shift away from the traditional policing of enforcement and looking more towards resource-driven problem-solving skills. So in other words, our, our police officers provide aftercare not personally, but get them wired in with the appropriate resources that can maybe help them um, when they are not currently in crisis. It's, it's based on a national model um, that we incorporated, again, going about three or four years ago, and it's been immensely successful. Um, we're very proud of it. I'm very, very proud of it, um, simply because we've, I think we've been able to impact a lot of people over the last couple of years, and it really has bridged some relationships, not only with clients here in the community, but also people um, in the various resources around Berkshire County, um, Franklin County, as well as Hamden County. Good. Again, just our Adventure <clears throat> Academy summer camp. That's just a couple of photos. Um, you know, the morning, the morning segment is a uh, classroom, and then in the afternoon, they'll go out and do adventure type stuff at our ropes course, swimming, um, you know, all sorts of fun stuff. So, that's about it. Relatively new program we instituted is the uh, DART response team. Um, drug addiction response officers. These officers um, are specifically trained to deal with and look after individuals who have, may have either overdosed or have issues with opioid and or alcohol issues. Uh, a lot of it they deal with our homeless people. Um, Molly Farber, Maddie Zilmack, and Justin Sikowski are the um, officers who have been specifically trained for this. Their responsibility really is if there's an individual in need they respond and do a lot of follow-up to make sure that not only the individuals who may have overdosed or been having issues with uh, addiction, but the families as well. So it encompasses a lot of the, you know, resource centers that we have, whether in Northampton, uh, at Cooley Dickinson Hospital. Uh, it's a lot of work, and, and they're really, really good at what they do. So, uh, again, continuing on with our outreach, the Craig, Craig Stores liaison officer, it's a really important uh, job that they have, both Casey Nagel and uh, Mike Barone. Um, they go to the shelter every night for intake and to assist the people there with the shelter. Um, you know, they're, they're happy to have officers around. Both these guys know all of the homeless people individually and what their special needs are. Um, you know, again, very, very successful. Um, they're there in the morning when it's closing up to make sure everything goes smoothly. So, um, you know, a lot of things going on in the background that you might not see. So, you know, training, a really important part of what our agency is all about. Um, I'm on the uh, state commission for, uh, state committee for training. I was appointed by Duval Patrick's administration back in 2010 and have been with them ever since. We really um, mandate what every police department and every police officer uh, has to be trained in every year. And there is very specific mandates about hours of training and what those um, training segments consist of. So you have the usual, um, you know, firearm, CPR, first aid, but then we'll, you know, we'll do segments, you know, on dealing with, um, you know, people with special needs or mental health issues. Dealing with autistic children was a big one. Um, a lot of what we choose as topics for police training comes from the public themselves or from legislators. Um, you know, so um, you know we're in that process right currently. I'll be going down to Boston tomorrow to decide what the next uh, group of trainings will be for the 2020 year. So um, very important. And then our Alice Safety Training Program. Um, you know, a good portion of our officers are all trained in this. Uh, matter of fact, we're down at the. Where are we tonight doing? Um, Jewish Community Center? Jewish Community, Jewish Community Center. Center doing a training for them. So we've been through all the public schools at least once, including the elementary schools. Most of the town buildings have had specific trainings um, in an active shooter in response to, you know, uh, 
special incidents, as we call it, but um, we are now branching out to the public in general to um, as needed and as requested. So a lot of what we do is um, you know, now transitioning over to community when specific to Alice training. So um, dispatch real quickly. Um, we oversee that. I oversee that 12 full-time dispatchers, one supervisor. His name is Mike Curtin. He does an unbelievable job. He knows a heck of a lot more, more about communications than I ever will. Uh, one of those positions is grant funded through the 9-11 grant. We are also the um, regional, hazmat dispatch, regional Hazmat Dispatch Center. There are only two in the, in the state. We are one of them. So they will dispatch hazmat um, teams from Worcester West uh, as our responsibility geographically. Um, you know, they, our dispatch center, I can't tell you enough great things about the job that they do. It's a difficult job. Um, it's hard to find really good people, and we're really, really fortunate to have the people. I would, I would, you know, encourage any of you to stop up into our dispatch center some night and just watch them in action because they're phenomenal. So, um, dispatch level types. That's just kind of in one year what they do as far as handling. That's just the, the phone calls they receive and the transmissions that they put out. Typically, there will be two to three uh, dispatchers. Always a minimum of two usually three and then in busy times could be four to five. So, um, you know, I always used to get asked in town meeting, when's regionalization coming? It's something that we're continuing to look for partners with and we, you know, continue to have discussions with uh, area towns about joining our, our award-winning dispatch center. So, and then animal welfare, um, the best advice I can give you on that is if you see Carol Hepburn coming, run. She, <laughs> If she gets hold of you, you know, you're not gonna get away again, but you know, Carol's probably the most well-known person in town um, for a lot of great reasons. Um, she does a, a really wonderful job. Uh, she's a great ambassador for everything, animals, whether handling complaints. One thing probably a lot of people don't know about Carol, Carol is she's also responsible for all the inspections on all the farms in town, which is, encompasses a lot of her work. So if a farm says, tells the state he's got four cows, she's got to make sure he has four cows and not 44 cows. So she actually goes to all the farms and does inspections and stuff. And then of course, responsible for all the dog licensing in town. And I think she told me she has about a 92% compliance rate. And I don't know how she figures that out. She's probably just filling me full of baloney, but I don't know. Well, I trust her. So um, uh, that's about it, I think. Is that it? Good to go? Questions? Thank you. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. Chief, thank you. Are we hanging around for questions or are we? <coughs> are there um, any immediate questions for the police department? Yes. Um, first I your, your mic, please. I want to say thank you for you specifically, Chief, and also the department and the support you gave us around the sanctuary bylaw. Um, I'm very grateful for that. I'm also interested, I understand there was a possibility of a restorative justice program with the police and I was wondering if there was any education around internalized racism. So restorative justice is part of the Massachusetts mandated training and we have participated in that but I also just did an agreement with our district attorney's office uh, for restorative justice. Um, so we are participants in that and with our district attorney's office we participate in that. So you're very welcome. Other questions? Yes, um, Dorothy. Could you give me uh, an example? Um, the crisis intervention team, what kind of things you go to? So typically, um, a lot of things that would be perhaps masked as a disturbance or would appear on our daily logs as a disturbance could be somebody who was potentially in crisis. Um, and we found that the old model of policing would be that we would go there, kind of restore the peace, maybe problem solve a little bit, and basically, quite frankly, make the problem go away. Um, what we found is by dispatching, we'll redirect officers from another sector of town to go there that have special training, have probably already developed relationships with people, and, and try to get them in a place that's beyond just basically triaging the call that night. And then what we do follow-up wise is within the following week when crisis is no longer apparent, that same officer will recontact that person to see if there's something that we can do to help in terms of wiring them in with resources, um, if we can do something in terms of support. And quite frankly, sometimes we meet with the family members as well um, because they need support 
efficiently. That's just kind of like a bottled version of what CIT is, but you could apply it kind of in a cross-section of a variety of different related calls that we would have. One area that we've seen a significant increase in call volume is with the mental health issues, and so those officers would be very, um, they would be responsible for you know, dealing with those specific issues. Other questions at this point? Thank you for Thanks your presentation for your and for your service to the town. Would you like to bring up another chair? Okay. Are the mics on? Yes. Yes, they are. Okay. If you'll introduce all of yourselves and proceed. Thank you. Good evening. How are you? I'm fine. I'm Tim thanks. Nelson, uh, fire chief, been here eight and a half years. Started started out in uh, the city of Hole 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 you know, for twenty eight. Years. And I've brought my cohorts. I am Lindsey Stromgren, um, Assistant Fire Chief for uh, Operations and Training, Amherst, born and bred. I've uh, been here for my life. I've uh, been with the Amherst Fire Department since I attended UMass out of high school. My name is Jeff Olmsted, Assistant Fire Chief as well. I've uh, been with the Amherst Fire Department for 24 years. Uh, background before that was four years as a firefighter for the National Guard, and then 20 years full time, and then 20 years as a National Guardman retired. I oversee fire prevention and EMS primarily, as well as some of our specialized teams. So, just going to give, give give you a view of who who we are, what 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 we are, and what what we do. This is. A, general list of uh, some some of our responsibilities obviously fire EMS but also also there's a whole raft a raft of uh, other things that that we do uh, in the in the rest right wrestling we do all of, um, a good part 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 of our own build, building ground grounds may, may maintenance that's our own our own staff in addition to our vehicles some a good good deal of vehicle maintenance and the last the last line that's that's a category you really that is kind kind of all all on 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 its own when folks really don't know what 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 to do or they're not not uh, not not sure of how to how to handle 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 something they'll they'll call call us and it runs from plum, plumbing electrical heat, heat, heating a dog stuck under the, under a porch you name it uh, when you don't know what to do you call 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 a fire 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 so this is kind of very breaking down what what we 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 do. Uh, we, you know, we we provide fire and EMS for the entire 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 town. EMS for uh, shoot 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 shoots very really well Leverton and Pelham on on a con contract track basis. And of course, and that and the town includes all 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 three uh, well the two two called colleges and the university. One, you know, um, and addition, addition to that, we also, you know, each uh, the town town has, you know, police force, DPW. Each each school has its own police police force, and and a well the physical plant which take which is their their DPW, and but we but but we take take care of all 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 fire and EMS services and inspection services. For the entire town and all and all three three schools, you have you have an idea there of uh, our our call 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 volume over 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 the last year and our average average call 
call called calls per day. <clears throat> we operate out of two stations, one that's rather old, as I'm sure you know. Uh, <laughs> yeah, right, right down, down downtown, and then one up on east, our, our north station on east East Pleasant Street. Uh, and we're three we're, th we're three four forces, but we're one we're one team. So the career career force is uh, the on the on duty do, do, duty folks, uh, 20, 24 four hours a day, seven days a week, 365, 306, 66 during a leap 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 year. Uh, that we're on we're on, we're on duty. Our call and students student force they um, they they they're our support. They uh, sub sub supplement the career 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 force. It's just a very brief break breakdown of uh, uh, of how 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 we're supposed to split up. So again, for first off, uh, more more deep deep deeply into, into the career career force. As you see, uh, there's a lot of responsibility that we we carry, and of course, all fire 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 related related calls, EMS. Rest, rest, rescue that 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 type of type type of thing. One of our big, big, big four, four portions of our department is our preventive preventive prevention department. It kind of goes on in, in 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 the, the background, but it's a crit crit critical part of what what we do. We also do a lot of fire fire, fire investigation. Have has have has material materials large and small. And then there's an emergency man, man, management fun, function. I'm also the emergency manager for the town. I was just going to talk talk briefly about the other two forces because I directly oversee them. As the chief mentioned, uh, we're kind of a unique department with three forces. Uh, most departments around us are either all full time, or there's a few that are full time with some traditional call force, which means they're paid part time. We actually have three forces, like he said, the full time people that handle all the day to day calls. The call force are um, people that live and or work in the community. Um, they are on call 24 hours a day for structure fires. They get called in to handle station coverages, which is, means the full-time people are all tied up on ambulance or fire calls. We need to bring people back in to stand by for the next calls. So between the, well, the student force, I'll cover the student force um, are primarily UMass students. Occasionally we have a Hampshire or Amherst College student. Um, this, they are in service during the academic year, so September through December and uh, February through May. Um, they have a schedule where they have four of them in the fire station at night, every night, seven days a week, and 24 hours a day on weekends. And six of them actually live at the North Station that was built with dormitory space. Throw, so through a schedule, uh, depending on the time of day, day of week, month of year, uh, the student force and call force handle these station coverages when the career firefighters are tied up on calls. And each one of them also does a variety of uh, outreach functions. They respond as first responders if there's an EMS call and we don't have an ambulance available. Oh, yes. <laughs> and I had the privilege of uh, serving on all three forces. I did start as a student firefighter uh, when I graduated Amherst High School, went to UMass. I was on that for a number of years. Uh, I then graduated, went to the call force for a number of years, and then became full-time, uh, which is where I am now. This is uh, ah, shoot. This is a break, 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 breakdown of some of our uh, response, responses. to the, sort of the the high, the high lights. Uh, you know, you, you look at look at the uh, fire, fire number. You say nine and nine ninety one, and then uh, structure structure fires that were the thirty eight. You would think there's you know the town town might be burn, 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 burning down, but that's that's a that's that's how 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 they're co coded for 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 for, for the state. A tra trash can fire is considered a fire, okay. Uh, uh, and, and then there's uh, there's also also car car fires, br 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 brush fire. So it, it, it's all a, it, it's all on how how, how they're co coded for for for, for the state. Uh, dollar, dollar loss. Significant. That's that's for, uh, for for last 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 year. That was uh, most of that is one is the uh, fire we had had on Main on Main Main Street. That was a significant one. Uh, and we uh, CO uh, carbon monoxide calls are are incre increasing. You know, and and part part of that is the ed 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 educational piece, pu pushing folks. 
to get get CCL, CLD detectors, but also 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 to to call us when 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 when, when, when they do ag, ag, activate. So you can see our EMS numbers. The EMS system here is, is fairly busy and active um, for the size department. We are we did over 5,000 calls again last year. We know we're going to have a, a drop this year because of the change in the Hadley contract. Um, but even looking at last year, we averaged about 14.2 calls per day. That's over the course of that uh, FY 2018. Um, but we think that our numbers are going to drop probably back to where we were around 2012, 2013 range because of the change in Hadley. Uh, we're still going to Hadley occasionally for mutual aid and for paramedic intercepts, uh, but those numbers are fairly small. I think we've been there about 30-ish times so far, this, this, or 25 times of this past uh, six months. Um, that being said, we expect that this is an opportunity for us to try to look ahead that five years from now we're going to be back to where we were before July 1st came, where we were really busy, crews were very tired, um, and they were working very hard trying to keep up with the call volume that we had. You know, we look at this town and we look at some of the impacts that we have on our call volume. So college students have always sort of taken a heavy rap in the media for the volume of calls you might do here. But honestly, there are fairly consistent uh, number of calls we do there. It's a busy call volume, and certainly as the university has increased, uh, we've seen those increases with it, um, but surprisingly, it's our over 60 population that drives our biggest increases. So I'm going to show you the next slide here. So this is a sort of six-year run by uh, time and age. And if you were to look up at the 18 and 22-year-old group, you'll see a fairly consistent line across there in the 11, 1,200 calls per year range and tops out at just about 9,000. But if you drop down and you look at the over 65 group, you see that we went from 1273 in 2010 to almost 2,000 calls for that age group by 2017. So when we mentioned that, you know, or over 60 is really what's driving us, so it's in town, it's in Amherst, that's what we're talking about. And it was interesting to me, that, you know, that we, when we put this out and we got these numbers back, the uh, 12,000 calls total over that time frame was, uh, was significant. And I'd like to add that, I mean, part, part of that is because this is a nice place to be. The Val, 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 Valley in Am Amerson, in, in particular, is 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 considered said to be a, a, a very good, good, good uh, place to be. Folks come, 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 come here to visit. They come, come here to shop. They come, come, come here to work. They they li like it here, and then they, they retire to the tire here. So, so that's so that's 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 kind kind of the dry, dry, driver in our in, in our call 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 volume. So. Does anybody have a question before I move on? You look like you have one, sir. The spike was really in the last, spike was in the last two years of the over 65. Yeah, yeah, you really look at that 2014, 15 changeover and then up through 16 and 17. And some of these may be related to, you know, we have assisted living in town. Yeah. Um, we have Applewood, we have University Drive, we have uh, Center for Extended Care. Those are all places that, you know, have a high density of folks who are, who are in that age range. And the other, the other piece of this is that the baby boomers are getting older, you know, and that, that was a large, oh. that, that, that was a large, large group, and we, uh, <laughs> as I look at these, these two, uh, <laughs> uh, Speak for we, you. hey, easy, <laughs> you know, we, you know, the baby boomer, that large group, you know, right after the war, are getting older, so that is so that so that's part part that's all also part 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 of the mix. So when we look at numbers and we look at if you could just go back one, if you look at numbers, we don't expect the college age group to change. Inevitably, mm -hmm. it might go up a little bit, but it's going to be fairly consistent. Mm -hmm. We don't see anything but increases in to our call volume for that over 65 group as the baby boomers continue to, you know, age. Yeah. So that's going to be a continued source of, of calls and, and resources for us to uh, provide. And people are, you know, we're all living long, long, longer. You know, uh, folks are, especially our dem the demographic here, folks are used, used to very good, good health, health, health care. And we're, we are that first step in, into good, uh, the good, good health care that, that we have, have around here. So those are, those are all fa 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 factors. 
just want to explain a little bit about our, the three different levels we have as EMTs. We have, at this point, 38 paramedics, uh, three advanced, and, and four basic EMTs. And the differences are largely about education, uh, skills, and experience. Um, our basic EMTs, as you can see, uh, the three of those, they took an initial, and we all did when we started, initial 120-hour class, about one college semester. Uh, we teach them skills during that class of CPR and using an automatic defibrillator, fluid control, splinting, um, and then they work out and they, they work on recertification every two years from there. Our advanced have a little bit larger scope of practice and we take all those skills we learned as basic EMTs and we add some more uh, understanding of the body and physiology, uh, chemistry, medicine, and we give them some more skills. And the paramedics, those are what we provide on all our ambulances all the time. Uh, they do a fantastic job and we can measure a lot of our paramedics, not just in number of years, but actually closer to decades. I have some folks and a couple of them back in the room who have been practicing for one or two decades <coughs> as uh, paramedics, uh, and they do a great job. But just that initial class was 12 to 1500 hours of classroom training uh, clinical time, uh, field time, and that was really just the beginning. So if we hire a new person, regardless of where they come from, we work with them on a mentoring uh, program to teach them about our area, the number of people that we interact with, the first responder groups we work with, the area that we work in, because we go to three other communities. We have three campuses on in town, and we expect a lot of our paramedics to run and manage scenes because they may not get any support depending on how busy we are because there may not many people to send them to give support. So we ask a lot of them. Next slide, please. Therefore, training is constant. You know, for patient care needs, our recertification that happens every two years, we're looking for best practices always. <coughs> There's always new equipment. Um, the level of, for example, what we do with cardiac monitoring. When I first started, we were interested in how fast how the rhythm, was it, was it, was it normal or no, abnormal? Um, and now we're worried about putting 12 leads on and looking at the whole heart. We're trying to interpret to make sure, see if someone's having a heart attack and make sure if they are, we take them to the right place that they can get uh, definitive care. Um, and we'll see other changes. We'll probably see ultrasound sometime in the back of the ambulance in the next five years. Um, because if anything else, medicine keeps moving forward and that pushes down on us and we'll continue to advance and advance our scope of practice over time. Recertification I mentioned. Oh, sorry, if you go back a second. Um, we look at 60 hours of training for every one of our advanced and paramedics um, every two years. That's a pretty significant training load to put on somebody every two years, and we have to do that both on duty and off duty and try to find a way to get, accomplish that. And on duty training is definitely a struggle. So we send people out to do some of these trainings um, on a pretty frequent basis to accomplish that. We also do training, first responder training for Amherst Police. Uh, paramedics teach there. And we spend a fair amount of time working um, medical training during active threat with the three uh, police departments in town. And we've actually branched out and trying to do some community-based police control training that you'll see both in town hall during the safety as well as uh, we'd like to expand out into the schools eventually. Next slide, please. Well, ultimately, it's bigger than it looks. For every call that we do, we have a QA uh, group that looks at our calls. Every call is looked at for both quality and for billing to make sure documentation and information is correct, that we did a good job to take care of our patients. Um, and ultimately, the billing process is a eff constant effort to make better for both billing and ultimately collections, because the money that we collect is important to the uh, services we provide. Slide. Yeah. No, it's me. Yeah. So uh, the rest, 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 rescue side of the house. Uh, again, it run, runs, it run, runs a, gang, a gamut. Uh, and we talked talk about hazardous materials. We've got uh, five, five of our per, per, per personnel, including, including my, myself, or mem members of the state, state re 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 regional team. That's a great uh, asset here in town. Uh, there's a lot of. It's not just the big, you know, fuel fuel truck and this and that go go going off 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 the road. We've got uh, we've had mer 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 mercury spills in, in homes. 
we have there's uh, we've had and had a few uh, home home labs that that uh, that, that have pop, popped up, and g given that uh, UMass is right 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 down 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 the road, we tend to have a lot of retired prof professors that have collected stuff over 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 the years, and then they. They, they 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 pass away and some someone goes goes to clean clean out their uh, shed or whatever and you find some rather exotic stuff there, so <laughs> so you know so so that so that's 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 part of, part of, part of what 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 uh, what we do and as the uh, police police chief mentioned the, uh, the we have one 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 of the dis, dis uh, has 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 met dis, dispatch centers for for the uh, state. What he neglected to say was that I brought that here when I came came here, so I just want to put a, throw 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 that in there. So uh, jaws, jaws of life. That's our quick equipment to extricate uh, people from uh, car accidents and what 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 have have you. One thing I've noted noticed since I've been 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 here, that folks just don't know how to drive here. I swear, <laughs> I'm telling you, uh, it's it's uh, yeah, folks just don't know how to drive. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, Assistant Chief Olmstead was talking to talk about some of the spe special teams. We d we have a, a group of mev medics that embed with uh, with uh, with uh, Am Amherst Police, U UMass Police, and Am Am Amherst Col 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 College Police for spe special si situations. They work and train 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 w w with them on a con 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 uh, year year round round. In fact. Uh, the res rescue ta task force—that's a new, th well, re relatively new, new thing. It actually came came out of uh, the call Columbine in in incident. Active sh sh shooter, uh, some some kind of attack, uh, some some uh, a rogue dri dri driving a truck 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 through through through, through a crowd. Our on duty do 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 staff is there. They're the ones that, that are going to respond first. And in in the past, it was wait, wait, wait until the scene is completely safe to go 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 in and, and ex extricate the victims. But that's changed now, to where uh, you know you're you're on you're on duty duty staff with the proper proper tra training and equi equipment, protective equipment, can can go go in and ex ex, ex extricate pa pa patients quick. Quickly and and it and it and it worked. It saves 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 lives. So we we initially initiated that about a year ago. It, year yeah, and a half ago. it's it's really the medical side of yeah. the active uh, threat uh, response. So we're kind of the next component after the police of of taking care of, of the initial threat, and then we embed with them a different police that may come in, either in town or from mutual aid, and provide the medical support that goes with it. So tech, and then tech, tech rescue rest, rest, rest is high rope, high high angle combined confined space that, that that type 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 of thing. We have our own team. We've had a team here for I mean the, the Amherst team for 20 years. 20, 20, 20, 20 years, and from that sprung the re regional uh, tech, tech re rescue team. Uh, many, uh, many of our mem members are uh, founding them, members of that of that that of that group. And of course, we do ice and open wall water rest rescue here. This, as I said earlier, uh, this is one, this is part part of our job that doesn't get a lot of a lot of uh, press or whatever. It's not it's not se sexy, but it's effective. It's probably one of the big biggest parts of making this a safe community, and it's a critical. Part part of make, make, making our community safe, and again, as I said, it happens sort of in the bab, bab, background. So this is really, a, like the chief said, a big part of, of what we do is trying to provide prevention services so that we can eliminate or um, <coughs> excuse me <coughs> prevent incidents from happening, fires in particular. And we use a variety of, of focuses to do that. We do it through code enforcement. We do it through public education. Um, we try to find ways to do community outreach. Um, there's a number of things. So really, if you build a new home or you want to do a renovation on your house or if you want to put up a new building, uh, we want to build a new school, a new science center, all those new buildings that you see going across UMass campus, all that inspection work for the building itself, the fire alarm system, I should say, and the sprinkler systems, and even those special places like hazard material storage, that inspection work was done by the fire department. The state provides a building inspector for, say, the University of Massachusetts. 
um, and we do a lot of work with them and their staff at their uh, emergency uh, health and safety folks that work there. Uh, we do a lot of permitting inspections, and you can see the long list there. Uh, I do want to emphasize the uh, SAFE program and our fire safety education that we're very proud of. We've had 23 years of success. Uh, it was a group that I was a part of for 15 years and really enjoyed. Uh, we do a lot of, we've advanced that into our senior SAFE. Um, we're trying to do outreach into our, to our seniors. Um, using a lot of the same principles that we do in Senior Safe, and we've had really good results with that so far. Community outreach, you know, fraternities and sororities, working with uh, the building inspectors and with Bill Laramie from Amherst Police, trying to do community outreach and reach out to those areas that they've been working on in the Faring, Phillips Street, uh, the old fraternity row area. That's been a big focus for us. Fire investigations, all fires have to be investigated for cause and origin. But not most of those fires we investigate ourselves, but there are particular types that we have more interaction and get support from the Amherst Police Detective Bureau particularly, uh, and particular calls that we contact the State Police Fire Marshal's Office for their assistance. This is another one, one of those things that kind of goes on in the background and only come, comes, comes uh, it, it only really becomes known that during some type, 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 type of emergency. So we do a lot of, as I said, I'm the, I'm the emergency management director, director for, for, for the town. But along with, with that, I do a lot of, or we do a lot of collaboration with, 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 uh, with, with the state and, and, and with all, all three, three uh, schools. Uh, we're, we're part of their emergency management teams at all, as, as well. Because again, what 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 happen, hap, happens there can affect, affect us. What happen, happens here can affect affect them. So 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 we work work on in, in a collaborative, collaborative way, to, you know, to 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 make sure that we we have the tools and policies and procedures to save the city to manage uh, pretty much any any kind 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 of event uh, disaster, if 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 you will. And so that that includes you know exercise size size sizing those plans. We're gonna uh, actually the town's team is we're, we're set, is setting up a uh, an ex exercise for next for next month. So that's so this is kind of, kind of time 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 timely. So uh, we're up, we're kind of constantly up, updated dating our emergency management plans. And as as I said, we we we, don't, we work joint, joint, jointly with all all three schools. And some some of that involves, as you can see, Mullins Con Con concerts, graduations, super, you know, knock on wood, Super Bowl this 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 year, uh, World World Series series this past past fall, and then the in, infamous Blarney blow blow blowout. Those are all things that where where we where, uh, we sit and plan for the what 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 is. You plan for the worst and you hope for the best. And that and that's and that's an ongoing pro pro process. Uh, even that, you know, a half a half marathon, mayor marathon. That's something something we, we work we work on. And of course, you're, you know, being the new new the New England, it's weather weather related related events. We'll start, you know, when like uh, you know the storm coming coming up this weekend. We've you know we've we've been watching that for a couple of days. Uh, if 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 the Pats win uh, sun 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 Sunday. We'll begin plan, pl planning the next the next day with with you 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 you, you UMass and 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 the, and the AEPD. So these these are things that are on, ongoing and kind of as I said go on in, in the back 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 background, but they're cr cr critical. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the operations of the department. Um, I. Our key asset to provide the service we do to the town is our people. We need to have well-trained people, good people, well-trained people. That's our most in, important resource. But for them to do their job, they need uh, vehicles, they need equipment, and they need a building to house them in. So that's a large part of my job. It's also a large part of our budget after the uh, salaries of everybody. So a quick talk about the, um, you know, the chief mentioned earlier the buildings. We have the two fire stations. Um, one thing I think is unique to us as a department is we have no custodial staff, we have no building maintenance staff, it's our on-duty firefighters that are doing all this work. I don't think we mentioned the number in the beginning, we have eight on-duty firefighters as our minimum staffing during the school year, seven right now during intercession and summer. So we have seven or eight people on duty in those two stations doing all of the stuff you saw earlier, the number of fire calls, the number of EMS calls, a lot of the fire prevention, et cetera. 
um, and as I mentioned, the call and student supplement here and there. But the majority of what we've talked about tonight are done by those seven or eight on-duty firefighters. We'll talk about that at the end just under challenges. But one of those things is they're doing all these services that in most other departments are provided by other staff, custodial building maintenance, et cetera. So we are doing all the maintenance and cleaning of our buildings, snow plowing during storms, lawn mowing around the North Station, and a lot of the basic maintenance of our fire stations. Uh, vehicles is our next single biggest resource in order to, do the, to provide the service we do. Uh, we do have five fire engines, five ambulances, not always staff. We have five ambulances, a ladder truck, um, a rescue, and then a number of other support vehicles. So that's a big part of our job is to keep those on the road and keep them up to date. We do a lot of the basic maintenance, routine, and repairs in-house using on-duty firefighters, sometimes firefighters on overtime. Uh, bigger repairs, uh, safety-related things like brake jobs we send out to uh, mechanics. But anything we can do in-house saves a lot of money. Shop rate these days for a large vehicle is about $110, $120 an hour for a mechanic. Uh, even if I pay a firefighter overtime, it's a third of that. So uh, anything we can do in-house is a big savings, but this is a big part of our operating budget every year. Can you talk about community out, out oops, ah, sorry. <laughs> Talk about community out, 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 outreach. There's a rat, as I said, as said before. There's a rat, raft of things, things that we're 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 involved, involved with, and this and this it pretty much cuts uh, throughout the, throughout the, the depart, department from the three three chiefs through our on, on duty staff and the and our uh, the call and the student for for forces. They're all we're all involved in 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 these in these these types of type, types of community out 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 outreach items i mean the list the list is even long, longer 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 than 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 this but there's all kinds of things that we're we're involved all in. because you know again we are part part of the community the community and and this and these, these and it's 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 a critical critical part of what we do you want to add to there he's got a couple minutes left so. yeah yeah i'll sign sure yeah and just back to equipment again, um, another big part of what we do is our radio communication system. I'm not going to spend too much time on that, but a couple of the key points, um, police chief mentioned the dispatch center. Um, part of that is we actually have a third facility uh, up on Mount Lincoln in Pelham. It's a small radio shack, but that is where the primary transmitters are for the police department, the fire department, and actually many other agencies. And we maintain that facility. We have a microwave link from the police station right here to Mount Lincoln. We have a number of our remote radio sites listening for transmissions around town, as does the police department. All in all, we have about 100 pagers in the field, um, 40 or so mobile radios, about 60 portable radios. So we have a lot of radio equipment. Um, our needs are we need to be able to talk to ambulances up in Greenfield for Franklin Medical Center. We need to be able to talk to our ambulances down in Springfield at Bay State Medical. So that's a pretty big geographical area we need to maintain radio communications with. So again, that's a, a large part of what we have up and running in the background. We do a lot of that programming and maintenance ourselves in-house. And then just a quick note on computers. Uh, it's becoming more and more part of our job. Um, our paramedics are carrying laptops in the fields, are doing their patient reports in the ambulances and at the hospital, and that's immediately transmitted back for uh, billing. Um, and then we obviously were everything from controlling radios to fire reports are also done on uh, our, our computer system. And fortunately, the town has a very good IT department that is, helps us keep that up and running. And they're always very responsive uh, to our needs. But it's becoming more and more part of what we do. Thank you. So the chief mentioned a little bit some of those other responses you might not think of. You know, they could be, you know, flooded basements, which we saw this week as we started seeing the cold, cold temperatures and the, the frozen pipes that break inside the, uh, the house, especially on some of our rental properties that are, you know, they're left alone during the Christmas break. Uh, power lines down, uh, animal rescues, uh, electrical, plumbing, heating issues, carbon monoxide malfunctions when it beeps, and ultimately when you don't know what to do, people call the fire department. We always encourage that. It's always safer to call us and make sure we can sort it out or help you deal with your problem. Um, than to just let it go. So we appreciate the people to call, um, but ultimately it's, it takes time and, and it takes some work, and I'm very proud of the folks that go out there and, and take care of these calls that may not seem to be what you'd expect, but they always do a good job and good community service for the folks that we, we interact with. 
shout out to the child, child, just, the, and we have, we have, have, we have, have our, our share. I mean, uh, staff, staff, uh, staffing has been, been a child challenge long before, before, before I got, got here. I mean, we've, uh, we've, we've main, maintained our staff, staff staffing as, as, as it is, is now, but as, as you've seen, our, our call, call vol, vol, vol volume has risen, and it, it rises at pretty much a steady rate each, each year. And that's, and that, and that, and that can, and that is, is a big, big, big challenge. challenge. And, uh, we still find a way, way to serve, 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 serve the pub, pub, public, keep and keep, keep the town, town, town safe. But it is, it is, it is a challenge, challenge, to, challenge to, to, to keep, keep up that, that, that uh, pace at, at our staffing level. Um, next, oh, we, remember, we mentioned the new, the new state station, which I think is near and dear to a few, some of the, some of someone's heart. Uh, it was built in 1929. 20, 20, uh, there have been four stu studies, five studies done on, uh, on, on replacement. The fir first one was done in 1947, so, and it was built in 1929. So uh, it's, 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 it's just, you know, we, we've out, outgrown grown it. It's, just, it it's, it's not in, in a good, good, good place as the town, town has grown. And, and we've heard, heard, heard it all before, but it just doesn't fit, fit it doesn't fit the needs of a modern fire, 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 fire. I mean, it, it, it really does, doesn't. Uh, we just have to get out of that place, <laughs> I mean, to be blunt. So, want to add anything or no? Uh, station training. Yeah. Training. This is training. Is that's pretty near and dear, dear to my my heart. Uh, you know, there's a, there's a saying: you train like you fight, you fight like like you train. I, I'm um, uh, Governor ba ba Baker point pointed me to the Mass Fire Training Training Con 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 Council about two year, years ago, and we're respons responsible f to set set the. Uh, set, the, set the tone and set the, set the Paul, Paul policies and guide 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 guidelines for fire train, training throughout throughout the state. On the EMS side of the house, there there are state state man mandates and, and, and things that we have we have we have to have, have have to do. Not, not not it's not so much on on the fire fire for fire side. There it's nat 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 nationally accept, accepted stands and standards that we. That, that we try try try, try to main, maintain and, and adhere adhere to, the, the, tra the training piece kind of goes back to our staff staff, staff, staff. and we uh, be because because of our call call volume and because of our level, our level our, our level of staff, staffing, most of our training is done by by our folks off to do do the duty. The, we we don't you don't get get the opportunity to train as a group as as a con, 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 con company because of our, our our call call volume. I like to say that fire 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 firefighting is a team sport. We we come with a group, we come with all with all 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 all, all our tools. We don't do things alone. We it could, it could be first first and foremost because it's, it's unsafe. But that, but but to do do that, you need to train train together, and we really don't get that that opportunity. So trying to find those opportunities to train as a group, as a company, is one 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 of those challenge challenge challenges. And we do the best 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 we can. We just need need to do do more. That's it. I'm good with that. Thank you. Are there questions? One more conclusion. I, I do want to. Last, last oh, I'm sorry. Last last slide. Last slide. So, again, last slide. Trust me. <laughs> so, again, as I said, we are a team. It's it's a team 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 con 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 concept, and we're working. I mean, we work work together together amongst amongst ourselves with our part 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 partners throughout throughout town. And really, it's because we want to make this a, a safe safe community, and that's and that's why that's why we do what 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 we do. That's why why we're 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 here. To take take care 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 of the community and to take take care of our pe people. We take if we take take care 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 of our per personnel, it means we, we can do that that much more for the community. And I mean, it says it right right there. Our per personnel really are our great great greatest resource. We have a talented, highly ed educated uh, for force here. Uh, extreme, 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 extremely so. And that goes in, into the flex, 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 flexibility part. We're going from 
fire fire call to am 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 ambulance call to uh, you name the name it back and now the same same people are jumping back and forth and back back and forth and making make, make, making this decisions snap to the decision decisions on 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 the fly and you need a talent talented educated force we attract very good good people some some high, highly talented 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 folks they want want to be be here they want want to be part of what 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 we do because bottom bottom line we're working hard for 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 our for our community that's what it's all about for us bottom, bottom line and with that First of all, I want to assure my colleagues, I was not on the first fire station <laughs> study committee, nor was I chair. <laughs> um, only the last two. Um, questions? Yes, shall I, I'm sorry. Yes, Mindy Jo. Um, I just had a quick one about um, forestry and wildland firefighting mm -hmm. and all. I, is there training going on for that, and is that a preparation since we do have the Holy Oak Range in our town? Well, we 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 do we 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 really don't have what what you'd call the wild wildland urban, urban interface. For us, most most mostly it's it's uh, brush brush type 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 fires. For the wild 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 wildland, we uh, the state the state here the state hand, 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 handles most of that. We we will go go in go in to, to, to assist and, and 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 we train 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 on on that. So. Other questions at this point? Yes, Shalini. Um, this is regarding the closure of the Station Road Bridge, and I understand there's no impact reaching the houses, um, mm -hmm. but um, do you have a sense of how much longer it is to go from the house, let's say in Amherst Hills or Station Road, to Gooley Dickinson Hospital or... We took a, took a look, 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 look at that, and really, there's no, no, there's, there's no in, increase in time because, because, and it's because of, of who, of who, who is going, which, which am, 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 ambulance or fire, fire truck is going, going to, to, to respond to the, that, uh, that air, 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 that air, area. Uh -huh. Am, 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 Amherst Woods are still going to go back, back up onto, onto route, route, route nine to go, go direct, direct, direct to Cooley Deck. So. We we we, uh, we took took a look and there's no in or in order to delay, so. Okay, thank you. Sure. Other questions? Yes, Alyssa. I don't know if this is a quick question or not, but I believe I saw a number on one of the slides early on that said there were false accidental alarms in the range of 916. Yeah. Do you have to roll equipment for every one of those? Yes, we do. Yeah, we do. I mean, you. you that that you know the determined term termination that that that's a false or accidental isn't made until after we, we we arrive and you always have to make to make sure I mean one of the, one of the things I'd, I like to say is that I'd rather rather send 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 ev everyone and find find out that we weren't that, uh, that that it was false than not send enough and find find out that uh, that uh, that it was a true emergency and you really don't know until you get get there investigate the call and clear the call. I would add, if I may, just also that that doesn't mean they were all false alarms, nothing was going on. Many of those call services are rendered. Again, it has to do with the way calls are coded. As an example, somebody may have a small, um, you know, they may burn the food on their stove, fill up the apartment with smoke, and we will go, it's, it's a false alarm, but we will spend 20, 30 minutes there with fans venting it out. It may be a false alarm that was caused by a water leak, and we'll go and shut the water off. Um, there's a whole host of things that where we're actually going to render some kind of service to the resident or who business. It's not just the alarm went off for some reason. Any other questions at this time? I'm sorry, Dorothy. Um, in your uh, student corps, have you ever gone to high school students? Um, in towns where I lived with a uh, total volunteer fire department, uh, high school students who are year-round residents served well. Mm -hmm. That's a good question. The answer is no, we haven't. Um, we've been, the student force has been around since 1953 in some capacity. Um, we have not branched out to the high schools. I am aware what you're talking about. New York State, Connecticut have a lot of them. They call them junior firefighter programs. Um, it's been talked about very briefly. 
Um, but we have not, we haven't gone to that level. Um, we, we actually have, are good at recruiting with our student force for the UMass. We keep it full. Um, not to say we couldn't look at a junior program somewhere down the road as, you know, a vocational training start for people to get them interested at the high school level. Well, one thing I would say is typically those junior programs are some kind of a ride-along program. Um, our student firefighters are fully trained as Firefighter 1 firefighters. They're operating their own truck, Engine 3. They have drivers, officers. So that's something you wouldn't see from a high school. We wouldn't do that with somebody under 18 for a student, but they would fill other roles. And I'd, oops, I'd like, to, like to add, uh, you know, the student, the student force was, it, it uh, was begun in collabor collaboration with U UMass back in 1953. And the stu students get, get call, call, college credit for their time time here. And one of the things that we, we do, we insist that they are student firefighters. For the school school come, 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 comes first. And one of the nice, nice things about have, have, having a, a career career force that is high, high, uh, high, highly edu educated, a lot, a lot of times we're, we're there to assist, 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 assist the, 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 the students in their, their academic lives. So it's, 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 uh, it's, a, it's just a really cool, cool, cool pro, pro, pro program, as you can see, one of, one of, one of the graduates. But we've had do, do, doctors, lawyers, uh, we have one, one uh, rocket science, 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 science scientist, and, and, just, uh, and some go, go, in, go, to, go into the fire, 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 fire service. But I think if you ran, ran into, into any of the, these folks down, down the road, what I, what I've, I mean, I was on a beach in San, 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 San Diego sitting one, one day, and someone saw, 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 saw my Amherst hat, and he said, is that Am 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 Amherst Mass? I said, yeah. He said, well, I, I was a student fire, fire, firefighter. I thought, oh, really? He's the dean of admissions at San Diego State. But he's, he's, he said, and I've heard this again and again, that that was pro probably one of the best times of his life and things that he learned, learned there, he, you know, he still still used, used in, in, in his life. So it's, it's a great, it's, it's, it's a really good, good, good pro program. Okay. Are there any other questions from the council? Thank you very much for the presentation you, and for your it. service to the town. Thank you. Appreciate it. We got applause. Um, at this time, do counselors have any other comments? We will have a public comment period as required, but are there any other comments from counselors? Yes, Alyssa? If I could briefly, I realize we're running very late. I want to both express my extreme appreciation for the fact that we're getting these. This is something that no other committee or body that I'm aware of in the town of Amherst has ever received this sort of orientation to the way our different departments work. So this is incredibly valuable. It would be even more valuable if we had PowerPoints emailed to us as people walked in so we could make notes. We have nothing to make notes on. I appreciate that we are not printing them out, but we are all just sitting here listening and I'm sure you're all excellent processors, but we don't have anything to take notes on that's associated with these things. And of course, as good presenters always do, they're not reading just every bullet point and they're also adding information that we have no place to put. And when you combine that with the fact that we had no time for questions for most of these, for many of these presentations, it's just difficult for us to figure out how we're going to most appropriately follow up. But that doesn't deny the fact that it's great to listen to. I'm just not 100% sure we all need to be sitting in the same room listening to it if they're just going to be taped presentations that anybody could watch. So I think we could make them even more valuable if we tweaked it a little bit. Okay, thank you. Other comments from the council? Is there anybody in the audience who would like to make a public comment? Seeing none, um, I would like to call uh, the meeting to adjourn. Is there a motion to do so? So moved. Second? Okay, thank you. We are adjourned. Oh, all those in favor, I'm sorry. <laughs>